So, we're finally back taking a look at Skylanders, and seriously, it means so much to me that everyone is so stoked to be back with this series, so thank you all so much for the awesome response to the previous episode. But following Trap Team, I had a lot of people warning me of the Skylanders games yet to come. You thought Trap Team was bad? Just wait until you play Superchargers. There were a lot of comments that shared this sentiment, and of course, there were some positive words to be said as well. But with the vast majority putting this game on blast, I didn't hesitate to get started. So, now that I've played it for myself, Allow me to tell you why Skylanders Superchargers gets 7 out of 10. Strap in and strap on. Chaos's grand scheme this time around is imprisoning Master Rion and taking control over all of the portals to Skylands, meaning that nobody can foil his plans to destroy and consume everything with this floating Sky Eater, which is generating power and life to the darkness. The darkness is an actual being, by the way. Yep, Jack's number one piss off for laziest villain idea. The darkness. Ooh, scary. Not to fret though, because the Superchargers are here to save the day. A team of new and familiar faces, each with their signature vehicle. Look at these things! We're just buying toy cars at this point, and I love it. Oh my god, is that a pink Easter pattern submarine? Give it to me, I need it! Thanks to Hugo's help, they're able to reach Skylands with the first mission being to break everyone out of prison and escape back to the academy. This introductory level, Jesus Christ, I actually turned the game off immediately because nothing gelled at all and it was a total mess. I didn't really know what to expect from a Skylanders vehicle oriented game going in, and there is so much dumped on you in this escape mission that I straight up hated it. We're going from very brief normal Skylanders gameplay into a vehicle driving around this open space, back to walking, only to jump into a boat and swirl around this lake, and now I'm flying around shooting at shit. It's a fucking mess. I genuinely stopped playing the game after this because I just couldn't deal with it. Thankfully, the second level was the total opposite of all that chaos. Jumping in, everything is stunning visually, and the entire game's structure made a lot more sense, so let's run through it. The way the game works is you've got your Skylander of choice, along with either a land, water, or flying vehicle. The land vehicles are standard, you get one with the game when you buy it, and it's required to beat the game. When you reach a certain spot within a level, you'll be prompted to jump into the vehicle to progress through either an open space with basic driving combat and puzzles, or along a track that leads you to the next part of the map. These actually make for some great set pieces, like we see here in the second level where we get to do some big jumps and race along the back of a giant dragon. That is awesome! Shadow of the Colossus anyone? The free range control threw me off at first, but you easily fall into it, and once you do, it feels good to play. As for the sea and flying segments, these act as additional side objectives that require you to purchase the appropriate vehicles to access them. It sounds shitty, but when you have access to these, it completely transforms this game. 
they open up these different environments so much more beyond the stale linear path and introduce so much variety that helps keep things fresh. Sometimes you're just floating around moving objects, other times you're attacking bosses, or even doing underwater exploration so you don't really know what to expect. Flying is often an open air space with some targets to shoot, but these are combined with more linear core sections as well. So, like your Swap Force mini-games or Elemental Gates, these all act as your side objectives to contrast the regular Skylanders gameplay. Elemental Gates are still here, but based on the element of your vehicle, not the character you're playing as. Again, these are just mini challenge levels, but something new I absolutely love is being able to access all of these from the Skylanders Academy hub area. That's great! With all of these extra areas to navigate, the length of levels has started to grow again, so it helps being able to bypass some of this stuff if you don't feel like it. So that's all well and good, but what if you don't own a sky or water vehicle? You can still progress, remember, these are side objectives after all, but it's incredibly unnatural to be told, look at this thing we must destroy, and then just getting skipped ahead because you can't access the area. But in my opinion, you're only letting yourself down coming into this without a vehicle of each different type. And here is where I feel like we're going to run into a lot of the polarizing discussion and butt heads when it comes to this game. Because why should you have to buy a bunch of extra stuff just to access the best parts of the experience? I totally agree with you there, because I'm not a fan of it myself. But, let's try to look at this from a different angle. Let's take a quick run through the history of Skylanders figures up until now. Starting with the first game, let's discuss the bare minimum amount of figures you need to access all of the good stuff. Out of 32 overall figures, you only need 8 to fully explore this game. One character of each element. Moving on to Skylanders Giants, assuming you still have all of your figures from the previous game, you only need one additional figure to access everything. Beautiful. Part of the reason Giants was such a solid game. Now with Swap Force, this is where things get tricky. You can play through the story without any additional figures, but you won't be able to access any of the new side areas. So now we need to get 8 more figures to cover each of the new swap abilities, which ultimately makes figures from the previous games feel a bit worthless. That's pretty lame, but this is where Trap Team really irks me. Now not only do you need 10 new Trap Master figures to access Elemental Gates, but you also need 10 different Elemental Trap Crystals to access everything in the game, and it makes all of your previous figures worthless. That's absolutely fucked. I guess you can still technically beat this game without any new stuff, but can you even call that living? Okay, I know this has been a long segment, but now we're up to supercharges. The absolute bare minimum you need to play this game is one supercharger figure and one land vehicle. That's actually not so bad at all, but the bare minimum you need to access everything within the levels is one supercharger figure and three different vehicles. That is so much more accessible. It's less money to spend for the amount of content you get in return, and while your old figures can't customise vehicles, as long as you've got one supercharger that can, then you're set up to see everything this game has to offer. Hopefully now that I've showcased it in this light, we can start to get on the same page and agree that while the Toys to Life business model has and always will be predatory and scummy, that Superchargers remains one of the best value examples of this business model to ever exist.
So, when you put all of this together into a full level, the end result is very dynamic and inventive where the playstyle is constantly changing on top of an already amazing selection of level gimmicks to go along with it. Like I already mentioned, the second map includes a large run along the back of a huge dragon up to a temple. The level following this takes place in a city of clouds where you're running through with limited visibility. Others include gimmicked puzzles involving magnetism, changing the size of objects, and inverted terrain where you're walking along walls or upside down. It really helps to make each location we visit feel unique and highly memorable. And even when the gameplay isn't overly gimmicked, the theme is something like Honey I Shrunk the Kids, where you're running around avoiding being stomped on and attacking the now giant insects. Or, it's the complete opposite where you're turned into a giant running around destroying everything. Missed opportunity to utilise the giant figures for a specific challenge in this location, but how can you complain when the game offers something different in each new level while still remaining true to the core gameplay that the series succeeds at? That's probably the most admirable thing about Superchargers, is that through all of the different vehicle segments, the beat-em-up collectathon gameplay does not take a back seat, as the balancing act across the board is very well executed. Speaking of this giant level, I actually encountered an incredibly frustrating glitch right before the ending which sucks. I mean, look at this, what the hell am I supposed to do here? I had a level breaking glitch while playing through Trap Team as well, where enemies failed to spawn in, which meant that I got stuck, meaning I had to exit the map and play through the entire thing again. Well, thankfully, Superchargers has finally remedied this problem by splitting each level up into multiple chapters with checkpoints. So, not only was I able to easily restart the final section without any hassle, but this also allows you to effortlessly go back to replay certain areas for missing collectibles, or just to replay segments. My god, how did we survive the previous four games without this? It's these quality of life fixes that go a long way for me. Even opening the various containers you find is a lot quicker this time around, which prevents them slowing you down. There were still a couple of levels that weren't so great, however. Battle Brawl Island was nothing more than a really lame combat arena. Ratchet and Clank 2, this is not. But it was something to break up the formula, I suppose. Same case with the vehicle combat arena later on, where the side path through a gauntlet of Skystone's puzzles took longer than the actual level. Can I just say, though, that these are more convoluted and time-wasty for no apparent reason, and I really got sick of seeing them. Same for the lock puzzles with the floaty physics. But, I really find it hard to complain about these things when you go from such a weak level like this into an absolute whopper like the Spellpunk Library. Each gameplay segment here takes place within a storybook, running across the various pages while the deep history and lore of Skylands is read back to us. It's so fucking cool. So, I find it difficult to grasp the hate for this game. I really do. It seems to me that a lot of it all stems from the actual figures, which I've already discussed. But, admittedly, there are actually some shitty aspects to superchargers that I've failed to mention so far. While you don't need a lot of new figures to play through this game, there is still a lot in our collection that gets wasted here. All of the old abilities is a big one of course, but what about our traps from the previous game? We spent a lot of time capturing all of those Doom Raiders, so can we play as any of them here? The new portal has a trap slot, but no, you can't. The traps don't do dick in this game. All you get for using them is a sky stone for the trapped character, as well as an elemental boost in the driving segments. 
What a fucking waste. I should be mad at superchargers for this, but I'm actually just further disappointed by how lackluster and unimportant Trap Team was to this franchise. None of your magic items work either. Some of these do exist as power-ups within the game, but actually using the physical power-up item only gives you dumb little treasures to place around the hub area. This feature is actually pretty neat though. You can place objects around wherever you please. Some give you access to hidden areas or grant you money or other rewards, while others are purely aesthetic. I always enjoy when games let you do this kind of thing. It's such a minor detail, but perfect for a game like Skylanders, intended for a younger audience. I just wish that years of collecting these power-ups wasn't pissed away like this. The Academy itself is massive once again, but there is less wasted space this time around. We can access training areas and minigames for the various vehicles, and upgrade all of our stuff as usual. Vehicle customization is a big thing I wasn't expecting this game to include. We can find new parts all over the levels to pimp these rides out, which I must say, is pretty awesome. All of the vehicle designs are great too, especially when matched with their character. Using them together supercharges the vehicle for a boost which is nice, and the cast of characters new and old is very solid. We have Stealth Elf, Trigger Happy, Jetstream, and Terrafin to name a few, but come on, why can't I use my old figures to get that supercharge boost? That's a dick move if I've ever seen one. And of all the magic characters to include, why Pop Fizz? He sucks! Where the hell is Spyro? It's 2015 by now, you know that the Netflix series will be dropping next year, with Spyro returning as the face of this franchise, where the hell is he? Meanwhile, over on the Wii U version, you lucky bastards got to play as Donkey Kong and Bowser, which is pretty rad. I guess a lot of those things are just nitpicks at the end of the day, but it is a definite shame seeing that all of our figures from the previous games no longer hold any value here, much like we saw with Trap Team. Still though, like I've said in the past, I am prepared to ignore the unfortunate business tactics as long as the game still offers value for the price of entry and is actually fun to play through. And it is! <laughs> what can I say? There are so many twists and turns through both the gameplay and the narrative here, and yet we only have one goal the entire game trying to figure out a way to destroy the Sky Eater and the darkness of Skylands. We eventually get to Prison Break, the spirit of Master Eon, which is fun. Greetings, Portal Master. Thank you for releasing me. Master Eon doesn't have any idea how to defeat the bad guys either, so he just sends us on a wild goose chase for fun. A lot of help you are, old man. Every new action our heroes take though, something goes wrong and wouldn't you know, the actions actually have consequences in this game. When the team fails, you actually feel it and the goals you're working towards for the entire game can be pulled right out from under you. That's something the franchise always struggled with, giving our objectives weight, and I feel like Superchargers does this expertly for what it is, just a dumb little kids game. Hell, I'm engaged, and that's got to count for something, right? Even the hub area feels the brunt of consequence and changes as we play through the game. This is one of the greatest details any game can include, and I'm so glad to see it back after Trap Team failed to include it. 
It all comes down to a final boss fight against Chaos, and while I preferred the Trap Team fight, this is still one of the better battles of the series. But getting to see Chaos struggle between his decision to help the darkness or take control of his own destiny is actually quite interesting to witness and develops this character into a character, unlike nothing we've seen previously. He ultimately decides to double cross the darkness to help us win. Then, as we watch the credits roll, we can see the Sky Eater get sucked into a black hole. Oh, holy shit! You didn't really think this was over, did you? You can't defeat me, fools! Skylands is doomed, and the universe is mine! All shall fear and obey me! I am... Okay, that's bloody cool. It's not over yet. They faked us out. Is this the darkness or King K. Rule? The vehicle finale does drag on a bit much, but I can't deny that it's an ending that stands out from all of the others we've seen from Skylanders. So, good job. Now, with the world saved and Chaos hanging out in the Academy Tower, what else is there left to do? We've had challenge levels, combat arenas, time trials, tower defense, so I guess it's time for a full-on kart racing mode. That's right, we get a pair of tracks for each vehicle type, so let's jump in. I must say, it's very strange finally playing this after Crash Team Racing Nitro Fueled. But, wow, this is an incredibly fun addition. Everything is fast-paced and genuinely challenging on the highest difficulty. The balance between using your energy to boost down the track or attack enemies adds some strategy, and the item pickups are really fun too. Air races have an awesome flow to them with much more interesting layouts which include vertical climbs, but I must say, I am shocked by how much I love the water races. These are so fucking good. On surface level, things are much the same, but what makes this vehicle so great is the ability to dive down under obstacles or into hidden shortcuts, or hopping back out into the air. Its movement is so versatile and fluid to play that I'd actually love to see a full racing game in this style. That's how damn good this is. And for the courses themselves, they all have tremendously well executed layouts and themes ripped from locations across the entire franchise. You can even race online too. I can't say that the gameplay is that involved to have any longevity, but it really completes this game. What a shame it's so limited with only six courses all up. So, let's fix that by breaking out some racing action packs that contained a new figure and supercharged kart combo, but also a racing trophy. Place these on the portal to unlock two additional courses for that vehicle type, as well as boss races, and the ability to play as those characters once you defeat them. I love it, but I'll have to admit, these additions get tiring quickly, as you need to win on the track in a regular race first, then you need to play it again to fight the boss, which is just three laps of gunning them down. It's exhausting. Then once you unlock them, it's neat for sure, but these characters are quite overpowered and by the time you get them, you've run out of new content to play. Still though, that doesn't stop the fact that this racing mode is a lot of fun and just fits perfectly. Eat your heart out, Ty the Tasmanian Tiger. This is how you do a kart racing mode. But we're still not done yet. We all remember the Chaos Trap from Trap Team that allowed us to play as the series villain and how it was a disgusting waste? Well, allow me to introduce you to the Chaos Cup. This allows you to play as Chaos in the racing mode. 
but you don't need to unlock him, and you don't even get an additional chaos-themed racetrack to play. For fuck sake. How can you fools fuck this up two games in a row now? <sighs> Despite my few hang-ups with the racing mode, its inclusion helps to rocket superchargers to the top of the Skylanders food chain, as if it wasn't already an incredibly sound experience. The balance of gameplay across the wide variety of styles is so well done, accompanied with a logical, engaging story and stunning presentation as always, which is the reason why this game is worthy of a 7 out of 10. The lack of value on older figures does hold it back for sure, but it's still one of the most accessible Toys to Life games ever released, which is far more important to its success. I honestly don't know what else I can say about this one. It's just such a great game that constantly evolves as you play through, which is what makes this my favourite game of the entire franchise. So, you know what that means. You've got some big shoes to fill. But, until next time, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, be sure to leave a like, subscribe, and share. I'm Square Eye Jack, and I hope you have a great fucking day. Thanks for watching. <laughs>